I'm Crystal Keating, and this is the Johnny and Friends Ministry Podcast. Each week, we're bringing you real conversations about disability and finding hope through hardship and sharing practical ways that you can embrace people with special needs in your community. We've mentioned a lot of free tools and resources on the show, so be sure to go to johnnyandfriends.org slash podcast to find any of the booklets, videos, or links we've talked about and learn more about our guests. How can you create an inclusive environment where people with disabilities are welcomed and embraced into the fabric of the church, your home life, and your community? Is there anything you can do to bridge the gap between the isolation that is so often created because of disability and the community of a vibrant, inclusive church? Well, today I'm thrilled to be talking about some ways to bridge the gap, ways to remove physical and social barriers for people with disabilities, especially in the church. I'm sitting down with guests Greg Greer and Jameis Sinelli to talk about the spiritual emotional and physical needs of people impacted by disability and how church culture can be transformed when the indispensable parts of the body of Christ are included. We're a room full of Johnny and Friends ministry staff today as I sit down with Greg Greer and Jameis Sinelli to talk about having an irresistible church as we welcome and include people with disabilities into the body of Christ. Welcome to the podcast, Greg and Jema. Thank you, Crystal. Hey, thanks. Great to be here. So glad that you're here, and we're having an important conversation about the church, and I know you both love the church, and you're passionate about helping followers of Christ grow in their love for God, especially those impacted by disability. And I, I know you a little bit, but I'm really curious to know how each of you came to this point of wanting to minister to people and families affected by disability by working with Johnny and Friends. I began my career in sales and marketing, of all things. I came to Christ at, at, as a middle schooler and began my career in sales and marketing and did that for about 12 years. And we began being part of a leadership in a local church and believed in the local church and Love the local church, that the church is plan A, there is no plan B. And through leading a small group in that church, God transitioned me into ministry. Mm -hmm. So I left my career in sales and marketing and began leading in a local church in a pastoral role and just began to really have a heart for folks who are broken. And people are broken by lots of things, you know, Mm -hmm. broken by affluence, broken by addiction, broken by disability even. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, it's been a real growth for me to to go through that, and it's been an honor to serve in this capacity for the last two years. Well, it's great to have you here, and I'm so glad to get to know you a little bit better. Jama, what about you? You've been working here for four years. So four years in July, yes, and I came from a vocational rehab background, so I said I had worked for 20-plus years helping individuals with disabilities find employment, but I, I had always had a heart for the Lord and a heart for the local church. My husband was a pastor for several years. So when I realized, oh, at Johnny and Friends, I could do both of those, bring those loves together right. of understanding the needs of individuals with disabilities, but instead of helping them find employment, to help them find the Lord and to help the church realize what a need there was to have that part of the body of Christ present. Absolutely. What do you do currently You're in the Ohio Johnny and Friends location. I am in the Ohio office. I am the area director there, which that means, and Greg serves in that role in Tennessee, we just wear lots of hats. Um, So, (laughs) but but we're really the, we're in the field services of of Johnny and Friends. So we're the the boots on the ground kind of of having the the ministry happen. So I started out with uh, church engagement. So that was my heart. So to really reach out to the church. Mm-hmm. And then I went into more of a development role. And now my role as area director kind of pulls all that together. So I oversee the ministry, the vision of the ministry in that local area, uh, engaging with donors and friends of the ministry, and just really trying to make sure that our mission is met, that we are communicating the gospel and equipping the local church. That's right. That's right. Greg, you want to add to that? 
I don't think I can. That was really well said. In fact, did you have the website up? No, no. You're reading that? You had to memorize that, right? No, you know awesome. that now. I, I knew it. I could, I could have done it. it beca- yeah. <laughs> well, I know that as you work with families and individuals who are living with disabilities, you've got to have these amazing stories, both locally and internationally. We work internationally with churches about the body of Christ being transformed by embracing people with disabilities into every fabric of worship, every part of the church, the home life, the community. So I'm, I'm just curious to learn from both of you, what, what are some of the ways that you've seen that ministering to and with people with disabilities in the name of Christ deepens the church's capacity to really know and love God? It makes the church flourish, right? It does. And, and to me, what's exciting is when churches fully embrace our friends with disability, that church becomes alive. That church begins to really to really grow, and they become very healthy. And I think one of the reasons that is is because so many people come to our churches and are broken in many ways, like I said, and some of them are yes, not as visible are. as others. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so when, a, when a, a child with autism screams out and a church handles that in a, in a gracious way, mm. that person that's there who has the invisible issue— it feels safe. Mm-hmm. Hey, this this church will accept me. Mm-hmm. So I think that that over time creates a very healthy church. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think good. I love to see the brokenness and the the love of Christ. You know that we, I mean, Scripture tells us that when we are weak, He is strong. And I think what I love to see with individuals with disabilities being embraced in a church and being part of that church. And as we all have heard Johnny say, it's not disability ministry until the disabled are ministering. Amen. So to see that co-laboring together, but you stand back and you say, you know that where there is that weakness, that visible weakness sometimes, you stand back and say, only God, only God can do right. that. So it's just a reminder to us that we are so weak when we know that we can see the what some might call the weaker parts of the body of Christ, that's where we see his strength mm. all the more. We, and we've got a church, uh, a church partner that many would call an affluent church. Mm-hmm. The interesting thing about it, this church is, it may be affluent, but they have, uh, their greeters are many times their friends with Down syndrome. Their friends with Down syndrome help administer communion. They're, they're serving. With, they're uh-huh. serving. They're fully integrated into the body. Mm-hmm. And so you've got this, beautiful dichotomy of this, you know, wealthy, affluent, mm-hmm. kind of hip place that's embracing all people. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of that culture we're talking about, that their church becomes healthy when they do that. That is so good. Well, I heard something so fabulous yesterday from our own Dr. Ben Rhodes. He was talking about 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul is listing all the spiritual gifts and all the parts of the body and that's where we, you know, we keep mentioning indispensable and the, you know, the weaker parts of the body. And Paul is talking about that. And one of the things Ben said is, he said, if you think about a body and if you take away part of the body, that's where we get that word, even disability, where there's, there's part of a lack. And he said, if you look at the body of Christ and Paul says that the things that seem weaker are actually the indispensable parts. So if we think of people with disabilities as the weaker parts, if they're not part of our churches, the body of Christ is actually disabled mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. we all have a puzzle piece to play mm-hmm. and that every spirit-filled Christian has a spiritual gift to give. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think what's part of that and I've not given this a lot of thought through a theological lens, but a part of that, we all have to have a, a missing part to be ministered to. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's so true. Mm-hmm. Those who encourage are encouraging folks who need encouragement. Mm. Those who are teaching are teaching people who need to hear the, the message. So this is an interesting, beautiful picture of the body, the interdependence of the body. Absolutely. That's so good. And I, and I don't know that we think about it often, but it's a conversation we need to start having. But I know you guys are having it in Ohio and Tennessee. So when you are looking at your own communities, what are you seeing as some of the needs of those who live with disabilities, not just in your states and in your your churches, but even around the world? What are you guys identifying as some of the major needs? I think locally, unfortunately, we still get calls from families who 
I'll have a mom in tears on a Monday morning saying, we tried to go to another church on Sunday and we were asked to leave, you know, with churches just not feeling equipped to, to handle a, a child with a disability. Mm-hmm. And that's so sad to see that happen. So that's a big need that we see. I think there are churches that really want to reach out to families and embrace yeah. all families. And that's where we need to come alongside them and help help them be equipped. But then there are families out there that, you know, when you think about it, like I think we so often take for granted being able to get up and go to church on a Sunday morning that's and being so able to, to fellowship and worship with other believers. And there are families who truly feel like they cannot go. We've mm. We've had stories of one local church in our area that started a disability ministry and the mom and dad came to us and were so thankful that we had just gone and helped to train some of the leaders in that church because now they said their family can go to church together. The mom and dad, I remember when this first happened, the mom and dad came back and said this is the first time they'd been able to worship together in 14 years. 14 they ha- years. It had been that many years since they had been able to go in and sit in a church service together. And after they were able to take their son to church with them, and he was being ministered to in a safe environment, they could then become, the dad became part of the worship band, the mom's teaching. And the funny thing is they said there was, if there was a morning where they didn't really feel like going to church, the son is up, no, no, we're going to church, <laughs> you know, church, church. 14 so. years. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, And you can imagine in a developing nation, like Guatemala is the country that we serve out of Tennessee, there's really bad understanding of disability. And so many mm. times families see their child with a disability as, as being cursed. And mm. so for us to be able to go down for wheelchair distributions and other programs to be able to, first of all, help that family get a wheelchair. And we, as we do that, it's a bridge to the gospel, tell them about Jesus and help them understand properly how God right. feels about them and then connect them to a local church. And we've been blessed to be able to, in Guatemala City, to develop some relationships with some like-minded churches. The needs are evident, whether we're in the States or whether we're in Central America. People are hungry for the gospel. They're hungry for community, and they're hungry to know that my child is valuable and precious in the sight of God. How freeing is that, that you get that opportunity? Well, Jamie, you know, I've loved working with you over the years, especially as you were working closely with churches. And I think on several occasions, we've worked together as you've had needs. People are writing to Johnny and friends from Ohio, mm-hmm. and we're calling you saying, hey, can you help? You've even made some home visits for those who are landlocked because of disability. Do any of those visits stand out in your mind? One of the scariest ones, and this goes back, I just recently had to deal with some bioethical issues. And so there was one lady who called and she really was in so much pain and depression uh, with her her illness, her disability. And she she was looking to us for guidance on would it be okay if she died? But she is the she one. She wanted to end her life because she, she was wanted so to end, distressed. Yes, right. Um, mm. She had a uh, a severe illness, and she was being fed through a stomach tube, and she had lost a tremendous amount of weight. She had moved from another state to Ohio, mm. was very discouraged, very despondent, and a friend of hers had reached out to Johnny and friends here at the California office. But then when you guys got the call, you realized she was actually living in Ohio now. So you called me, and I called her. This is all coming back to me. Yes. (laughs) Yes. I called her and went to see her, and I'm thinking, oh, Lord. I mean, I remember talking to you the day before. Crystal, please be praying. I'm going to visit this lady, Mm -hmm. not knowing. Like, is she going to point blank ask me? You know, what she's I think asking is for permission, right? Exactly. She's, and she would say things like, well, you know, in, in California, it's legal. I can do this. I could would be able to die with dignity. And I had to just keep talking to her and praying with her and trying to help her see that she is a loved individual and has mm-hmm. value and is made in God's image. Mm-hmm. And And to be honest with you, What I expected to see when I walked in the room, she lived in an assisted living Hmm. facility at the time, to hear her talk, I I thought she was going to be just laying in a bed, not able to move, anything like that. But no, she was up and Hmm. moving around. It was just this woman needed a friend. Yes. She needed somebody to go in and pour into her life to say, you're not all alone. 
and her her whole demeanor has changed. Uh, she still has down days, but she has mm. my number, and she will call me at times, and mm. we just cry together, pray together, and try to encourage. But um, that's just one, that's that's the one that comes to my mind when you talk about going and just the hurt and the pain that is out there. But the way we're able to to reach out and and again, I didn't know what to say. You know, to go in, I was afraid of what right. what she might ask. But just saying, Lord, just use me. And he does. Well, the ministry of presence mm-hmm. is so much more powerful than we understand. That's great. And we hear this over and over again. Disability is so isolating. Mm-hmm. Disability, sometimes they're suffering with it. But the major suffering in a lot of ways is I'm disconnected from my church. I'm disconnected from God. I'm disconnected from friendships, Mm -hmm. and I have no hope of the future. Mm -hmm. And so that's where, in my mind, where the church comes in. So, Jamie, you could spend every day visiting somebody who needs a friend, but how are you training churches to actually go out, as it says in Luke 14, into the streets, into the alleyways, to actually bring the church to the disabled? And, Greg, I know you're, you're doing the same thing. How are you guys working together to with the church? Well, part of it is just an awareness, finding out where a church is, what what their vision is, where their heart for ministry is, and then being able to come alongside them. Some churches don't even realize the need for disability ministry, and others want to do it, but they don't feel equipped. So we just really try to, to come alongside and open the eyes of individuals. And we try, at least for me, I've tried to make it clear. And I I say sometimes in trainings that we go and do at churches, you don't have to be a trained professional to do this. You know, if I'm doing a training, first of all, I say, if you've come here today for me to train you to become an expert on autism or an expert on cerebral palsy, you may as well leave now because that's not the goal of this. I'm not going to be able to make you an expert. I'm not an expert. On every disability. On every disability, exactly. But what I can help you to see, and my goal for a training, is to help you see that, number one, if you love the Lord and His Word, and then you love His people, you're qualified to be able to do this. God will open doors for you and give you words to speak, and it's just about loving people and Coming alongside people, being that friend, it's like our family retreats are one of the greatest training grounds where we want to take people from churches and take them to one of our family retreats and show them what a church service can look like, what having people together in the body of Christ can look like. I mean, people say for family retreat, it's like a little slice of heaven. And if you've never been to one, I mean, it's like I remember when the scales fell from my eyes. Mm. It's just a thing of beauty. But so to, to bring churches to that point and show them that, you know, it's not about having to know exactly what to say, exactly what to do. Mm-hmm. It's just realizing that I'm one broken person ministering to another broken person mm-hmm. with the love of Christ. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Yeah, and I think sometimes what we've been able to do is to sit down with, with a church who wants to do something to reach their community, particularly those outside of their church who are affected by disability, and we just are a sounding board, and we help them process some of their ideas. And That's so have important. Have you considered doing a Saturday, you know, festival mm-hmm. for the community? And this one church did that, and they actually went a step further before they even planned the event. They actually reached out to all the families that they knew in their community and asked them what they needed Oh, what that's they, what great. They want. Imagine that, right? Wow. Starting with what someone might need. <laughs> and and they and they did that. And they had, you know, a hundred or more f- folks come to this big festival that they offered. First thing they'd ever done. Oh, mm-hmm. And they had church volunteers sign up. And it was just a first step for them. Well, that was two years ago. Now that church is fully embracing the community uh, with, you know, of the families affected by disability. And it's really mm-hmm. become a vibrant, made the church vibrant. Mm-hmm. And the leaders of the church have said, where folks might not know how to act with somebody that comes in with a disability now, or comp- the the church at large is the culture's been changed. Mm-hmm. They they get wow. it. Wow, yeah. Greg, I love what you said about this church doing a festival and calling all the families and asking them, "What do you need?" And I think that's so important that we are serving one another. Johnny and Friends is serving the church, 
And so as you're working with churches, how do you help them identify and understand some of the barriers that they may have, even physical or social, to welcoming and embracing people affected by disability? Obviously, you're not going in there guns blazing and saying, oh, look, you don't have this, that, and the other. How do you guys do that? Well, I think the first thing for us is just to sit down with the leadership of the church and just establish where they are in the ministry and what their heart do, do you have a heart? Do you want to reach to the community? And if you do, let's talk about the first step, you know, and that might be, in this case, it was a, a festival. In other cases, it might be a, a respite where we where you invite a few families that maybe are already yeah. a part of your church to come one Friday night, as this church has done as well, and leave their kids for three hours and go on a date. And, you know, there I think there are just small steps that churches can do mm-hmm. to ease into this, if you will, mm-hmm. just, just to make it um, make the transition smoother. And we've just just listened to them, see where they are, see what their heart is, help them figure out ways that might work within their context. One size does not fit all. That's true. And there's so many resources that are available with Johnny and Friends. I'll do a, a plug for our church training resources. Uh, that was one of the things when I first came to Johnny and Friends, I was amazed with how many resources that there were available. And actually, I know in the Ohio office, I first looked and there were lots of books on the shelf in the office. And I said, this will not do. Why are they on the shelf in the office? They need to be out, out in the hands right? of churches. Yeah. So now, of course, everything's online. So there is a, a series of books, 12 booklets that have topics that are the questions from what I've been told, questions that churches asked, the most commonly asked questions. It's just a nice set of booklets that can be downloaded and are those resources that are available. So things like if a church wants to reach out to families, there is uh, a survey, a checklist, those some real practical helps. So I would recommend going on the website to those resources too. That's right. So a church can actually utilize those resources to evaluate their own church and say, right. you know, do we have a ramp mm-hmm. at the most basic level? Do we have accessible parking? Do we have bathrooms that are wide enough for wheelchairs. And then it moves to what about our attitudes? Right. Are we right. thinking about mm-hmm. not just caring for people with disabilities, but are they serving? Mm-hmm. Are they part of our worship? Are they visible? All of those things matter. Mm-hmm. And so thanks for bringing up those booklets. They are really good. I mean, the first booklet is called Start With Hello. Mm-hmm. And that's the most basic thing. It's the festival where you're building friendships. And then they talk about respite helping families who are in the thick of disability, all the way to accessible worship and um, buddy ministries. So really, really good stuff. And looking at the whole, the whole culture of the church and coming alongside, helping to to change that culture from what might be seen as, uh, as an ignorance, not, not in a bad way, but just really that, like, not really knowing what to do. Where are we as a church? What what do we need to do? All the way to we are a body of Christ with members who are broken in one way or another ministering together, whether that be a, an actual diagnosed disability, an invisible disability, or a visible disability. We want to come alongside churches and help them through that culture change. And I think it was Johnny who said that every church will be blessed to have an autistic child yell out during a worship service. That's yes. right. Yeah. 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 And do we even have opportunities for that mm-hmm. because they're present? Mm-hmm. So that's good. You know, Greg, I'm curious. You were a pastor for some time. One of the questions we get is, you know, here I am. I'm a mom. I have a child with a disability. Our church is awesome. They're loving And I want to approach our leadership about maybe ministering to people with disabilities on on a wider scheme, but I'm kind of intimidated. As a pastor, what are some of the ways that you think are the best ways to approach the leadership? I mean, it's a great question. I think it depends on how a church is structured. You know, sometimes it's if you are a small group oriented church, perhaps you go to your small group leader In our context, that would be kind of who your shepherd was. That was your deacon ministry, if you will. It would be your small group leader. So maybe there's an advocate there to at least begin to have a conversation. Maybe two of you go together to approach the appropriate staff person. But, I I mean, if the church is functioning in a healthy way, it is a community, right? And so it's a fellowship. And so there should not be any barrier to bringing something like that up. So I just wouldn't be intimidated by 
any particular perceived structure. If you're part of the family, go for it. Yeah, and yeah. I think one of the things that just rang true with me recently is that we're not going to a pastor. You don't need to go to a pastor or church leader and be wanting to start a new program. You know, I think sometimes if you go to a pastor who already has so much on their plate or right. any church leader who has so much on their plate and say, hey, you need to do this one more thing, you know, and that's not what we want to ask to do. It's just there is a group of people that are an unreached people group, a mission field in our own backyard, in our own backyard right. and we want to help you be able to minister them. I'm not asking you to start a new program, but just let's give you ways that, that your church can yeah. be open and embrace those individuals. So I think I think the way that mom might approach that pastor will will go a long way. Yeah, we had a church one time wrongly to think, well, this costs millions of dollars. And I'm thinking, what costs millions of dollars? So yeah. we just want to train some buddies. Right. Yeah. And right. find folks within the body who have a passion for this. Right. In our in our We make area, it difficult. Yeah. In our area, we have our, our county school systems have have these students who do this peer tutoring where they actually are tutors to their peers who have disability. Mm. So we have, you know, 13 high schools in one county that have students that dozens of them are probably believers and would love to be buddies in church. So it's just a matter great. of asking and yeah. connecting mm-hmm. those dots. Wow. Yeah, and, and knowing your your body, who is already connected with a family impacted by disability. And even if they're not, identifying the giftedness of the person, the warmness, that goes a long way. Well, you guys keep mentioning culture, and I think that's such a important thing to think about. We don't want to just have a tack on disability ministry, right? We want to see the culture of a church actually change. So what are some of the ways you've seen the culture of a local church kind of transform in order to welcome and include people of all abilities into every area of life in the church? I have one example that keeps coming to my mind, and it was from a a family that had two Two sons, they both had autism. They both were on the autism spectrum. One had a condition of what we call echolalia. So everything that you said was repeated back to you. Mm -hmm. So he was in a Sunday school classroom, and they would teach the lesson, and he would repeat exactly what the lesson was. But there was one day in particular that they were talking about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. And so they were going through this lesson and the teacher said to the one young man, she said, you know, telling him everything, Jesus does this, Jesus did this for you, Jesus loves you. So she got to the end and she said, Jesus is good, expecting him to say back to her, Jesus is good, because that's what he would do with everything. Jesus made the trees, Jesus made the trees, Jesus made the flowers, this back and forth. Mm -hmm. But she said to this young man, Jesus is good, and he looked at her and said, Jesus is awesome. <laughs> and I get, I've get i told that story so many times, but I get goosebumps even telling it now. And then his brother, who was nonverbal, when the mom came to pick him up, he went to the door and looked at his mom and said, Jesus, the first word he had said in several years. Whoa. Yeah. So you tell me what that does to the body of a church when you see that happen and you know that we worship God in spirit and in truth and God's spirit, and I don't care who you are, nobody's going to tell me that the spirit did not speak to those young men that day. Mm-hmm. I think it's important to let our, our churches know when we think about culture is that cognitive understanding is different from spiritual understanding. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm always That's reminded, huge. I'm always reminded of Emily Colson's story with her son, Max, mm-hmm. when they were really struggling with whether or not, you know, he, he understood enough to be baptized and if right. he really was born again. And mm-hmm. I remember her pastor said, you know, the Holy Spirit speaks Max. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, exactly. And I love that because <laughs> that's, Max yeah. language. that's what we need to help our churches understand. Right. That's a powerful meditation that the Spirit transcends mm-hmm. our cognitive abilities. Absolutely. That's powerful. Well, you know, you, you bring up Emily Colson's story, and if you haven't heard her message, it is one of our podcast episodes from December, so I highly recommend listening to it. It's so encouraging to see what God has done 
through Emily and her son, Max, in a situation that was very difficult, and actually how the church came around them. One of the things, as you know, families impacted by autism, it's very difficult to sit in a church service, especially if you don't, quote, have the gift of sitting still. Mm -hmm. And so they did backwards church where Emily and Max would come at the end of service and enjoy the coffee, and they had Max actually come and start stacking chairs and through this process of becoming a community to them, Max got baptized and how the love of Christ was displayed. And as you said, for onlookers Mm -hmm. who say, I may not have a visible disability, but I know what's going on inside of me. And if they're loved, I know I'm going to be too. Mm -hmm. And then the church, I love the story because I heard Emily tell it at a conference we had and where they actually gave Max a position. He had a volunteer ministry position. He was the back of the worship center worship leader. (laughs) I didn't know that. That's awesome. And the sound guys had had also reinforced some of the camera boxes. Yes. So that as Max was on the camera boxes and dancing, they wouldn't break because Emily saw him doing that and she said, he's going to break him. And the guy said, no, he's not. They reinforced it. Uh Where he was standing and jumping up and down, they reinforced the floor. Yeah, That is love. That is love. May we all be like churches like Uh that. uh Well, this has been so good, and there's just never enough minutes in our podcast to talk about all that we want to. But as we close our time together, what encouragement or advice would you both give to churches who want to better meet the spiritual, the emotional, the physical needs of people who are impacted by disability? I would just say very simply, just... Go for it. You know, you can try to think things through and get paralysis of analysis. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, just, you know, you wouldn't, I guess the question is, if this were your student ministry, you wouldn't be hung up on all of the details. Trust the Lord, trust your people to love them well. You know, the same as a pastor wouldn't think that it's on his shoulders to save someone coming in in a student ministry or a set of parents or a single mom or anybody Neither is it that pastor's responsibility to save that family affected by disability. It's Christ. Mm -hmm. It's the work of Christ. So don't don't overthink it. Don't try to do it on your own. Just step out in faith. As you would say, get out of the boat. Yeah. That's good. Well, thank you guys so much for being here with us today. And just that encouragement to love one family, one person at a time. So Greg and Jama, it's been a great time with you. Blessings as you go to Ohio and to Tennessee and do what you're doing. Appreciate thank it. You. Thanks for having us. What a great reminder that God's economy of value and importance is so different than the world's. Each of us brings value to the body of Christ, no matter our abilities. We are all needed, and we're all needy. It's clear that those living with disabilities are indispensable to the church. If you need practical help in creating a more inclusive church, Johnny and Friends is here to help. We have a number of tools and resources, including a free mini book called Pathways to Belonging that you can download at johnnyandfriends.org slash podcast. This book offers step-by-step tools for evaluating the needs of friends with disabilities in your community and creating a culture that welcomes these individuals and their families. And really, whatever your need, we're happy to provide training and resources for your church or connect you with an inclusive church in your area. If you have any questions, please send me a message at podcast at johnnyandfriends.org. Thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate our podcast with a five-star review. And to get our next episode automatically, please subscribe. I'm Crystal Keating, and this is the Johnny and Friends Ministry Podcast.